Cardiff. <laughs> <laughs> I love your little laugh. You're so humored by this. So in our current state of affairs in which we have a black president, uh, a time in which I routinely hear students, uh, colleagues, peers, even friends, um, who somehow believe that this, this utopia, because we have a black president, means that we no longer experience racism, uh, is so painfully uh, misinformed and so painfully reinforcing of um, just general ignorance uh, and an inability to want to engage the more critical questions about the ways in which race and racism operate. Uh, I find that it is important more so now than ever that when po uh, popular cultural instances of racism merge that we need to engage them and talk about them and talk about what's happening and how they operate in particular ways. Um, I would like to briefly turn to an observation I made last night while watching X-Men First Class, which I will admit was overall a very fun ride, and yes, better than Wolverine. Um, I would say somewhere placed between one and two. Um, but this is the freshest because I just saw it, and so I want to talk about some observations around a key character by the name of Darwin. Uh, Darwin is the only black character in this particular film. He self-names himself because uh, he apparently, his mutant power is that he's able to adapt in order to survive. Uh, the question I ask is, what is he adapting to in order to survive? Well, in his screen time, which doesn't get nearly 10 minutes in total, um, I think that the story that's being told is that he's teaching us and showing this that the black mutant's power is less about surviving humanity and rather learning how to adapt and survive as a black man in a white supremacist society. Uh, I have I want to show this through three specific examples or instances. Um, uh, first. Um, well, I guess the first three are specific instances. The fourth instance would actually be the fact that uh, he ends up being the first character or the first mutant that's killed in this film, uh, harking back to the token black man in most films, often in horror films, but still in this one, the black man's the first to go. Um, the problem that I see here, the way in which race is, uh, I guess, rhetorically mapped in this particular film is that mutant becomes some sort of transcendent category and tag so that we don't have to address these other key issues. We can say, oh, no, no, it's not a matter of race. It's a mutant war. Uh, and then forget what's taking place. And so I want to show the ways in which racism operates right in front of our eyes. But oftentimes, as was evident, I would say, with the audience around me, it wasn't talked about. So uh, I'm going to talk about three, besides the point of him being the first character dead or murdered, I'm going to talk about three instances in which racism is evaded and where the title of mutant serve as a means of allowing it to pass into the American psyche as a non-problem. Uh, first, Darwin plays into and seemingly challenges a white stereotype about black folk, namely that they cannot swim. Uh, so in his first instance of getting up to show his peers, the fellow uh, young mutants, his power, they all take turns in showing their power who's got the biggest one. Um, he walks over to a fish tank and dunks his head into the aquarium and then grows gills and is able to survive. Uh, at the surface, this is no problem. I, I get it. Um, fine. There is a specific problematic, however, when this becomes the way in which he decides to show us that he's able to thrive by working through a stereotype strategically mapped by white supremacy in ways to uh, uh, move motivate, push, force black bodies to do and not do certain things, to bar certain actions and to expect certain actions. Uh, so I find this potentially problematic. If that wasn't enough, we go to the second example. Uh, it's the way in which we then next see another instance in which he has apparently um, tra transformed in order to survive. He adapts to uh, these two white boys. Uh, I believe it's Havoc and um, a Banshee, I believe, are the two. Uh, these two white boys, teenage white boys, have large weapons, they look like baseball bats or sticks, and they're beating him. It's two white boys beating the black guy who's turning, has adapted some sort of stone artifice thing around his body, and so they're beating him. Uh, and so the picture itself to me is automatically reminiscent of Rodney King or really any uh, black man's uh, interaction with a white cop. Uh, especially here in Los Angeles. Um, I find this incredibly problematic and it really feeds into the first one that really adaptation of the black mutant character Darwin is less about adapting to the world as the world transforms and so much transforming the self in order to work within an institutional practice of racism without actually changing the system itself and that's where there's a problem with the film representation like this. Um, 
is what ends up being taught here is that one can change the self because something like racism is too big to change. So why even try to go at it? I find that potentially, or not even potentially, just painstakingly offensive uh, and really problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, so in short, what Darwin is showing is the audience is less about his powers to adapt in order to survive as a mutant. Rather, he has shown us that the black mutant adapts to the self in order to survive white racism, which does nothing to challenge institutional or material practices of racism. The white kids are taught nothing at all except keep beating the black kid because he now likes it and he smiles. He's learned to enjoy it. Uh, the third instance is when Sebastian, uh, the character played by Kevin Bacon, and his mutants come to enlist these young peers, or these young uh, mutants, into his particular army. Uh, there's a key rhetorical word that's used here in order to get them to join his side. He says, essentially, if you don't join our side, you will be enslaved. The word enslaved is used. Um, and some of you may, may roll your eyes. Uh, the problem with using this particular language is that the shot is shown with a tight shot, just like my face is here, cropped almost the same way, right here, of Darwin's face. And Darwin looking intensely back at Kevin Bacon's character. So he says enslaved, and this is where the mapping goes, to the black body, enslaved, black body, enslaved, black body. Um, we can say that that doesn't mean anything at all, I'm reading too deep into it, sure. But if that's the case, then I'm wondering this. The assumption being that if this word means nothing at all, my question is why was the character that was the black character chosen to really frame this particular word? Uh, if it is only for him, then somehow there's some sort of rhetorical intent and repeal, or appeal on the part of Kevin Bacon's character to enlist this particular individual into his army, which also assumes that none of the white characters have any actual point in this dialogue at all, meaning Kevin Bacon's character is only here to enlist him, uh, which he actually ends up resisting. And he pays for, because in the end, uh, Sebastian ends up actually uh, killing him. Um, he, in fact, says, adapt to this and ends up killing Darwin. Uh, okay, um, I will give you this. There is one other character of color. I don't want someone saying, well, what about the other one, the angel one? I can't remember what she calls herself. Her tattoos change to wings. I'll give you that. Fine, there's another character of color. But this is my problem with her. Why is it the other character of color is the one who uses her body in a sexual pornographic way? in which to validate herself and her uh, her everything. Uh, she's the, essentially, she is the exotic other. She is the racially ambiguous, she's the exotically beautiful, unmarked body that we can't seem to comprehend in any capacity. Her wings glisten, she's there to be looked at, she's there to be understood. She's not even a valid fighting machine except when she spits fire up, but we only finally see that at the end. And the instance of this particular first interaction here is where there's an initial problematic. And this is what I'm focusing on is Darwin. And if you want to look to the other character, the, the angel character, I can't remember her name off him, um, she becomes just the exotic other. In, in short, uh, the big point here is that in a film like this, we have to be, or any film, we ha or any instances of pop culture production, we need to be aware of and critical of the ways in which oppression and hatred are reified and produced and crafted and outsourced to audiences. This is an instance in which mutant becomes some sort of transcendent uh, characteristic that allows us to somehow not look to these issues. When I suggest that everyone needs to look back and understand these issues much more critically so that we can engage the world better prepared. That's all. Just an observation. Bye-bye.